thanks for the introduction. Um, just to re repeat, I'm a software engineer in the healthcare and life sciences team at Databricks. And just a bit of a teaser for the rest of the talk, today I'm very proud to be announcing that Databricks is creating an open source project in collaboration with Regeneron Genetic Center called GLOW to bring genomics to Spark. So, <laughs> and if you want to know more, I'll give you the link just in a little bit so you don't click away and look away right now. <laughs> so, how many of you, just by a show of hands, are part of the genomics community? Or are you just here because you're curious about genomics generally? Okay, yeah, you're at a Spark Summit. Probably most of you aren't that familiar with genomics. I'm going to start out with what is genomics? Why are we talking about it today? Well, genomics is a big data problem, which is why we're bringing Spark to help solve this problem. And why is it a problem? Because genomics is becoming such, um, getting genomic data is much cheaper nowadays. In 2001, when the first human genome was completed, the entire project took over $2 billion. Now, to sequence a human genome, it costs about $1,000. And so you saw there was kind of this trend following Moore's law, which is what we expected. But in 2008, a new technology came out called next generation sequencing. It all sounds very sci-fi, but in reality, it's kind of just like applying Spark to genotyping. You're breaking up the genome into little bits and parallelizing. <laughs> and as a result of it becoming so cheap, we anticipate genomic data being one of the biggest sources of data out there very, very soon, even surpassing these massive social media sites. So genomics results in big data, but what are we going to do with this big data? Why do we want to use it? Well, in any statistical analysis, the bigger your training set, the better your results. And one of the exciting spaces in genomics is actually accelerating drug development. And backing all the way up to your high school biology class, you've probably learned DNA makes RNA, RNA makes proteins, and proteins do a lot of exciting things in your body, sometimes not so exciting things. If you have two proteins, this is a very toy example, say a blue and a gray protein, and they're binding together at this green site in the middle. Maybe that's not what you actually want. When they bind together, maybe you get a disease. And so if you had a drug molecule in the body, this red molecule here, and it was able to block this interaction at the green binding site, so the blue and the gray protein stay far apart, then maybe you don't have the disease. But you can't actually take every pair of proteins that exist in the human body and just throw every drug that you have in the cabinet at them, or we won't ever get anywhere. So what do you end up doing? Well, like any other problem here at Spark Summit, you might just try machine learning. And so you might use linear regression or logistic regression to try to correlate your DNA variants, where an individual varies in the genome, in order to understand how it's associated with the trait of interest or a disease. Again, DNA to RNA to protein to the disease. And so it's this kind of indirect link for which we're trying to find an association. And here, our partners at the Regeneron Genetic Center were able to identify a drug target for chronic liver disease as a result of regression on a massive genomic data set. And in the pharmaceutical space, you're just trying to get a drug to market. This is actually more painful than it sounds. You can't just do a regression and then, you know, the next day you have a drug showing up in the pharmacy. You have to go through a really long approval process. And to get a drug all the way to the market, you often need biological evidence to support why it's happening. And when you have genetic evidence, as you can guess, the more likely you are to get your drug all the way to the pharmacy. So that's a big win for pharmaceuticals and a win for human healthcare overall. And this isn't the only space for which big genomic data is helpful for human health. So you also have precision medicine. For example, you may have heard about the BRCA gene, for which if you have a mutation, you may be more likely to develop breast cancer. And we were able to identify an individual's risk using something called a polygenic risk score. That sounds really fancy. All that's really doing is a weighted linear regression, and you can identify essentially, if you're really likely to have this disease, maybe you want to undergo a surgery to avoid getting it in the future. And also in the space of precision medicine, you have pharmacogenetics, where we can identify genetic variants that may change how you metabolize a drug differently. So for example, there's a drug called warfarin. If you are at increased risk of developing a stroke because of blood clots, you may be prescribed warfarin. 
However, the amount of warfarin that each person needs may differ, and that is in part because of your genetic variation. And if we give you too much of the drug, then you might have a really bad time with a paper cut. And if you have too little, then it won't end up doing anything for you. So doctors end up, what they do is you all go into the office, they give you a set starting amount, and then they adjust it week to week, and hope that in the meantime, you don't end up in the ER from a paper cut. And so if we had your genetic variation already known, then we could have started from a better starting point to avoid that from happening. So again, more genomic data, better results. So we're excited about genomic data on the big data scale, hopefully by now. However, it's not as easy as it looks. And that's because genomics has been around for a little while. And honestly, geneticists are probably some of the best command line scripters that I've ever met. If you want to see incredibly complex Perl scripts, they are your people. I don't understand a word of it, personally. I write a lot of Spark. Um, but these complex R, C++, Perl scripts, they don't always play nice on the large scale. And that's simply because if your code, if your data just doesn't fit on one machine, how are you supposed to get it to work? And so what you often end up doing is saying, OK, let's go ahead and take this big, flat genomic file. Here they're talking about a VCF file or a variant call format file and splitting it up by chromosome. This is fairly coarse grained. You only have 23 of them. So you're just cutting it into fairly unequal 20 thirds. But regardless, this is actually more complex than it looks. There isn't just some magical tool out there that everyone uses. In fact, on this forum, which is kind of like Stack Overflow for bioinformaticians, where people give unnecessarily sassy comments, <laughs> you get this for loop. We're using a tool called the Genome Analysis Toolkit, or GATK. They might say, you know what, actually, I don't like the GATK. Use VCF tools. It's much better. Actually, use Tabix. It's an indexing tool. It's even faster. And no, use this mysterious jar called Snipsif that you can find on GitHub. And so how do you even find the right tool when there's so many of them? And even when you do find the right tool, how do you know how to use it? Well, again, people ask a lot of questions on BioStars, and there's a common tool called Plink, and people ask a lot of questions, specifically over 800 of them. And even if you manage to figure out how to use Plink, you need to figure out how to use all these dozens of options in the command line space. And each of those has their own sub-options. It gets very complex very quickly. If you can understand all of them, I'm very impressed. I can't personally. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. <laughs> and when you do figure out one specific tool and you master it and all the different file formats that you can use as input and output formats, how do you start using other tools in association with it? Because even though Plink is incredibly complex, you can perform an end-to-end -end pipeline. Maybe there are some functionalities that are only available in other tools. So how do you integrate with them? Well, it's not as easy as it sounds, because while Plink supports these file formats, the UCSC or University of California at Santa Cruz Genomics Institute supports a different set of file formats, overlapping but not exactly the same, as does the National Cancer Institute and the Thousand Genome Project. So it gets very complex very quickly. And as a result of that, well, what do you waste your time on? Converting between file formats. And as I mentioned earlier, geneticists might be some of the best command line scripters out there. They're really good at awk, which is impressive, but that depends on your data being able to fit on one machine. And as a result of this, as the data sets get bigger and bigger into the petabyte scale, you start running into problems. And so rather than turn backwards into time to try to use old tools in the command line that worked back then, maybe you want to use Spark. And to work with Spark to get your genomic data in, we created Glow. So now I'm going to go into a nerdy tech talk about how Glow works. So if you're actually here for the computer science section, now you can tune back in. <laughs> So what exactly is GLOW? Well, it's an open source repository in which you can do genomic analysis using Spark. And because it's built on Spark, it automatically scales to the biobank scale. And that's in the hundreds of thousands and millions of individuals. And we can also perform queries using Spark SQL. And as I mentioned earlier, 
these uh, bioinformaticians may not be the most savvy, say, in Scala, but they're really good at R and Python. And so if, you want, if you're in Spark SQL, you can integrate with those easily. And you, again, don't have to learn any new tools. You can just use the existing ones, such as Plink, VCF tools, et cetera, as well as existing genomic file formats, because we created data sources for them. And if you want to live in the data frame world, you can use the rest of the Spark ecosystem, such as Delta Lakes, MLlib, and MLflow. And so the problems we talked about earlier, how to scale, how to learn, and how to integrate, we addressed all of those problems as part of the GLOW project. So now let's talk about the data sources. This one is specific for the variant call format file, or VCF file, that I mentioned earlier. It's a bit of a doozy. So the top section is where all the metadata is. It is where you see all these double pound signs followed by something like file format or info. Let's gray those out for now. After this metadata section, it actually looks a lot like a TSV or a tab separated file format. It's like a CSV, but bioinformaticians like tabs for some reason. So the first line is a header line. It says, okay, the lines after here are data. The first column represents the chromosome or the location of the genetic variation. The second column represents the location on the chromosome and so on. So each of the lines will represent where a genetic variant is located on the human genome, as well as details about each individual sample's uh, variation specifically. So for example, in the last three columns, each of which start with NA, which is an anonymized representation of an individual, you can see the first individual has a, um, both reference alleles, zero, pipe zero, and so on. And the first seven columns are always there. The rest of them aren't, which is why I'm not talking about them quite yet. But the e easy ones, if you want to get your VCF into a data frame, are to take these first seven columns and just change them into columns in the data frame because they never change. It's fairly straightforward. The first one, as I said earlier, is a chromosome. It's just a string. Just throw it in the data frame schema. That's easy enough. The other ones are integers, floats, flags, they can, or booleans, and they can be an array of ints. Again, fairly easy. The exciting part comes when we come to this info column, which represents variant information. And this is stuff that changes from row to row, and it refers all the way back to the beginning of the file with the metadata. By the way, this metadata can span, I think, gigabytes. It's actually kind of crazy. And so this essentially looks like a map, where the key and the value are represented by the, like say, ns is equal to three, or NS represents number of samples with data, and three is the number of samples. So you might think, as I did originally, hey, it looks like a map, let's just make it into a map. Why is it that complicated? Well, it does work for a little while. However, I went back to some of my customers and I said, hey, let's try this out. And they said, okay, we made a data frame, we did some filtering, now I want to write another file back out. I was like, wait, why would you want to do that? Just put it in Parquet, put it in Delta. And they said, no, the other teams need it in this file format. And I said, well, this is a problem. I have now lost your information. <laughs> All of your metadata is still in your flat file. You need to go back and figure it out. Turns out this is not acceptable when you're in a customer-facing role. <laughs> So I soon had to figure out, okay, how do I get the rest of this information when my schema only really has the ID? Well, and on top of that, querying is also slow because you have a map and a column and so on. And how you do that is you change the schema per file. Rather than forcing the file to have a certain schema every single time, by ch we change each of the metadata lines into one column. And so what this actually ends up looking like is this info metadata line becomes an entire schema column by itself in which we store ev all the information so that we can come back out and write the VCF file for the other teammates who insisted on using command line tools. And the rest of the columns are also exciting as well, I guess. <laughs> you have this metadata, you store it in this flattened schema. And here, this is another thing that I had to think about for a while was let's make each of these columns in the file into a column. That's fairly straightforward. But turns out the width of these files gets really big. If you have a one sample file, it's pretty small. You can just put another column on your data frame. 
But as you move into a, the biobank space with hundreds of thousands of participants or a million people, you're going to have a million column data frame. That doesn't go well <laughs> if you've tried using Spark. So all we have to do here is just pivot. It's just an array of this schema specified by the metadata. And that's how we got a schema that works well so that we can preserve metadata and write back out. We can query quickly. And we limit the number of columns so that Spark doesn't just explode. And I've geeked out about all these things that I had to worry about, but you won't have to worry about them at all if you're using the Glow project yourself. We have a VCF file format, so you just have to set it in the format field here. So your VCF becomes a data frame. And if you made your own VCF data frame, you can also write it out to a flat file as well. And you've heard about this during the keynote as well. You can put this in a delta lake. And it's not just because Databricks is telling me to talk about it. It's because in this delta lake, you can store additional information. You can get data sources from bgen or bed. Um, these are other file formats. I don't have time to talk about all of them. And also, you have other data sources, which when combined with genomic data, result in really interesting information, such as medical imaging, if you want to do cool deep learning methods, um, EHR data, waveform data, real world evidence data. Combine all that together to create a profile of an individual, and you can do much more. So now we've discussed the data sources for GLOW, specifically VCF. There's also BGen. It's when you have the data in the data frame, of course you can use Spark SQL functions to finagle it yourself. However, there are so many tools out there, and I don't necessarily want to force everyone to start from scratch. So how do we do that? Well, we built the functions into Spark SQL. So these are a couple of the functions that are commonly built into command line tools, um, and these were in part requested, for example, by our pharmaceutical customers. And I don't have time to discuss all of them, but this is one that I discussed earlier already, and it's genome-wide association studies, where you're identifying where genetic variants associate with the trait of interest. So there are a couple of different ways you can do this. You can do a linear regression if you have a continuous trait, such as BMI. You can do logistic regression if you have a binary trait, such as whether or not someone has diabetes. But what if you want to use one of the cool new libraries you found on CRAN, and I just didn't have time to implement it for you? Well, turns out this is a very common use case. For example, there's this library called Sage. It's gaining a lot of traction. It's especially interesting for the case in which the case and control groups are imbalanced, which is a fancy way of saying there are more people who don't have the disease than do have the disease, <laughs> which is true for most diseases, honestly. Um, and Sage is an R library. You can also integrate, you might also have Perl libraries. And you start from a flat VCF, and you output a CSV when you run Sage. And you end up, um, if you use their cool web interface, with something called a Manhattan plot, which is on the right. And just to explain it a little bit, the x-axis is the location on the genome. Each dot represents a genetic variant. And the y-axis represents how significant that variant is in association with the disease or trait of interest, here diabetes. So the higher a dot is on the y-axis, the more important that variation may be in association. And it creates this Manhattan plot because it looks like the Manhattan skyline a little bit. And so you might see here on chromosome 10, you have the Empire State Building. So if we wanted to use something like Sage traditionally, we would back, end up back on BioStars and have to figure out, how do I split this fat file by chromosome and try all the different maybe command line tools they threw at us? And you would have a very dedicated graduate student trying to break up your biobank data, starting from this VCF into tiny little ones, again, assuming that it fit on your, uh, their computer, running the command line tool, hoping the command line tool didn't break at any point and that they caught any mistakes that happened, getting another text file out here, a CSV, and then mashing those all together using some nice awk commands that they had learned. But this assumes a lot of things. I've said a lot of ifs here. First of all, we're assuming the data fits on your computer. Maybe it only works in a cloud compute setting. And so here, this is your computer may have exploded by this point, 
And this also assumes a very dedicated graduate student who is willing to catch every command line tool error that comes out. And so how do you become more fault tolerant? Well, you use Spark. And so the naive solution here might be to use something like RDD pipe. And this actually works pretty well. You start with a text RDD, here a massive VCF file. Each partition gets passed into a Spark worker, gets passed into standard in, the command line tool runs, and then from standard out for each partition, we create the partitions of a text RDD. However, this doesn't actually work that well for Sage and other such complex genomic file formats. And that's because of the limitations of RDDs in part. The start and the end are text RDDs, which means they only have one column. So you need to get every data line into the RDD and then pass the header in to the pipe context. And when you're reading back out, your CSV header lines or VCF header lines, whatever the type is, are all mashed together and you have to clean it up. And it's a lot of data munging. And as I mentioned earlier, bioinformaticians waste a lot of time doing data munging. And part of this is because of changing file specs. If you're part of one of these many uh, genomic consortiums, I think they meet basically every month to change the spec. It becomes very painful. <laughs> so how do we avoid this? Well, as part of the GLOW project, we implemented a pipe transformer. And so rather than force you to work with these text RDDs for which you would have to change between different file formats or different specs, you can start from a data frame and we'll take care of all the transformations to text for you. So we start from a data frame, which we've read in from a VCF or created from genomic data. Each of these partitions are passed into the Spark worker and then it's read back out as another data frame. So what's the magic behind this? Well, first of all, we have the input formatter. And this goes from our data frame and taking the schema writes a metadata section which um, contains all the information that the command line tool needs. And under here is where we are able to take care of all the transformations between file formats and specs. So for example, and for VCF specifically, we work with the third party library called HDSJDK and you can take an internal row we implement a converter between the internal row and the Spark data frame to this Java object, which the third party library then writes out to a flat file, which is able to match the most recent spec. Then we run the command. Here it's an R script. This one actually runs from an input flat file, so it's a little longer than this, but I cut that out. But traditionally it would run from standard in and write out to standard out. And for each partition, the input formatter would take the row, write it to text using potentially a third party HSJDK library and so on, and to text. This standard in gets passed in the command line tool. If the command runs into any problems, they'll do a retry like an RDD pipe. And if that fails, then it will get propagated all the way back to the driver so that your diligent grad student will be able to see the problem. And hopefully everything worked out and your output formatter will get all these text lines and create your data frame at the end with the schema that is specified in the text itself. And this output formatter for Sage specifically is in CSV. Here it's a TSV with a header. And so we just write that in the schema um, options. And this is just a little hack that we did to save a little bit of memory. <coughs> Traditionally, you would store each of the rows as a Spark row. This contains the schema as part of it. It's a little bit expensive. So rather than writing at the partition with an iterator of rows, we create an iterator with the schema and then internal rows, which are a little bit smaller. And so going over everything I just discussed, rather than having input and output text RDDs, we have data frames. And for the input and the output, we infer the header or the schema from the other. And under the hood, we perform conversions so that you don't have to worry about it yourself. Finally, I've discussed all the different parts of the GLOW project, well, some of them, and I'm going to discuss an end-to-end -end workflow and how it works with the rest of the Spark ecosystem. Specifically, I'm going to be discussing the Genome-Wide Association Study, or GWAS. This is not all the steps of an actual GWAS if you're in the genomics community. I'm sorry for dumbing it down this much, but these are the ones that you'll have to go through by minimum. 
So first of all, get the data from your flat file into a data frame. Pretty straightforward. Then you have some of the exciting steps, like performing quality control. The data that comes off a sequencing machine is not actually what is in your body necessarily. It's kind of a guess at what you probably have as a genetic variation. And so you might have low quality data. You might have data they're not super confident about. And so you will want to filter that out. Here, we have two functions built into GLOW, specifically call summary statistics and Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And we filter out rare variants for which we are not very confident. Then you can go ahead and put this in a delta lake in preparation for your next step. And in the delta lake, you might want to store additional information, such as each individual's ancestry. And what I mean by this is when you're doing a GWAS is to account for population stratification, which is able to remove some of the false positives that may occur. So to give a more concrete example, if your case group or the group that has a disease is more of one population than another, then your association study may falsely say, OK, if you have this genetic background, then you have this disease. That's not actually true. So we want to get rid of that using something like um, PCA, which is principal component analysis, to remove those dimensions that are associated with ancestry. And for PCA, you can perform SVD or singular value decomposition using your favorite machine learning library, such as Spark MLlib. Then you get to actually run the association study, such as SAGE or a linear regression. And here, we just run linear regression. It's fairly straightforward. We use a glue or utility function in GLOW, which, able, which is able to identify the number of minor alleles each individual has, which is then plugged into the regression, along with the ancestry values and the covariates, as well as any phenotype values here the disease. And finally, we end up with our GWAS hits, which are the values of the strength of the association between the genetic variants and the traits of interest. And that's a much smaller data set. So we can go from a data frame to an actual R data frame, and then use your favorite genomics plotting library, such as here, QQMan, which will make you a very pretty Manhattan plot, looking a bit something like this. And now that you have your beautiful Manhattan plot and you know which of the variants might be interesting to investigate downstream, potentially even the clinical setting, we should probably keep track of what we did all the way through here using something like MLflow, just so we know what parameters we set and what the plot we got out was. So this is a very simplified GWAS pipeline that you might be able to use. You start from a flat file. Here, I think some people have called it a bronze level table from a VCF. Read that into a data frame perform quality control, and with that, in a delta lake, you might combine that with phenotypes, ancestry data, and so on. And then we can perform our exciting analyses, such as an association study. And that's just about it. So <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for coming. I hope that you'll get to <laughs> try out the GLOW project. Regeneron Genetic Center and Databricks are very excited to be releasing this out to the real world. It's on GitHub and Maven Central and PyPy as of this morning. <laughs> and also, feel free to check out the splash page. It'll give you more information than what I discussed today. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. So uh, we have time for questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I'll run over to you with the microphone. <laughs> Great talk. Thank Thanks. You. Um, do you have any example notebooks or data sets that we can kind of play with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, on the GLOW website, we have a read the docs link. Okay. And there will be a bunch of Databricks notebooks and just general Spark code snippets before we can try it out. And we have some data sets on the Databricks side that have them. You'll also see um, for the Thousand Genomes project, you have those S3 buckets with the VCFs. So. Cool, OK. And does it need the HLS runtime, or is it just you? Oh, wow, you really know your stuff. <laughs> um, Glow is actually baked into the genomics runtime, which we rebranded the HLS runtime okay. as part of the general availability. It includes Glow, but you can use Glow separately just with Spark. Um, so if you're part of the genomics runtime, you can just use it out of the box. But um, if you want to use Glow separately, then you just go through a couple of the setup steps, and then you can use whatever operation that I discussed today. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm.
Hello, uh, thank you for uh, the great presentation. Um, actually, I have to do kind of a similar project, however, it's a bit different. Uh, what the client wants is to uh, use public data, so open target data. So it's basically uh, the studies where you already have the p-value, and they want to download all that data, and they want to create an API uh, based mm -hmm. on that. So the idea is you put, for example, a gene name or gene ID, and you would get all the variant with all the p-values associated to the, the phenotype. The challenge is it's also really big. I think we are talking of a, like, there is a table which links the studies to the variant. It's more than 100 billion rows. So it's very challenging. And I wonder, would GLOW fit into that kind of uh, uh, use case, whereas you based on the, the input would be the gene, then you would somehow fetch the, the rows uh, from that huge table and uh, well do a bit of joins and then send back the results uh, through an API. W would you consider Glow as a, uh, as a good fit for that use case? Um, so when you're starting from genetic variant data, I think it depends on what source you're starting with. Some of them are fairly straightforward to use uh, traditional Spark data sources, but if you're starting from a VCF, this is probably, I, I hope, your best option. Um, the rest of it actually seems like a Spark SQL question, and I'd love to discuss that offline. I've heard that request a couple of times as well, and it's something that I'd love to discuss. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, I guess we are done then. Thank you.